providing a coronavirus update. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, pleasingly, we had more than 48,000 people get tested to 8pm last night. We need those testing numbers to come up. Uh, as you're aware, the figures have been released uh, from Health in relation to the additional cases. Till 8pm last night, we had 18 cases uh, for that 24-hour period, but 13 of those were already known and announced. So there were five new cases from yesterday last night and six additional cases since 8pm this morning. So in total, there have been 11 new cases since we last updated the community. Pleasingly, all but one are linked and Dr Kerry Chant will provide information about that. So I do want to stress that all but one of those cases are linked uh, and, uh, and Dr Chant will uh, explain that in further detail. I also want to stress uh, the situation regarding me and Parliament House. Um, I was uh, interviewed by Health. Uh, Health has made their assessments and deemed uh, that I'm a casual contact. I was tested very early this morning and isolated and returned a negative test a couple of hours ago and I will continue to follow Health advice. Uh, can I say, notwithstanding those circumstances, that since the pandemic has started, this is perhaps the scariest period uh, that New South Wales is going through. And Dr Chan and I are of equal view of that. Uh, it is a very contagious variant, but at the same time, we are at this stage comfortable that the settings that are in place are the appropriate settings, but that's so long as everybody does the right thing. Please be extra cautious. Uh, uh, I took a test and was negative before I was even interviewed by health and made sure I took all those necessary precautions and I'll continue to monitor the health advice and that's very important. Uh, obviously colleagues are going through that process this morning to ensure that nobody enters uh, the chamber to pass the budget until all of those assessments have been made and uh, any questions regarding what is a uh, casual contact or a close contact, obviously Dr Chant is here to answer. But obviously uh, whenever there is a positive case that person is interviewed extensively uh, that person is interviewed about uh, their, their movements and that applies to every case. Uh, and it was certainly an experience going through that process uh, and appreciating uh, the wonderful work that our health contact tracers do. So I do want to stress uh, that my level of concern is uh, medium to high uh, across New South Wales, but at the same time, the couple of things that we're pleased about is that all the new cases but one are linked and that one is under investigation. Uh, we do expect more cases in the coming days, but we also please expect everybody to do the right thing. Please know that wearing a mask doesn't mean you're protected from getting the virus. We've always said that mask wearing is the fourth line of defence. You need to socially distance, you need to hand sanitise, you need to make sure that every time you go out of the, your home and you're thinking about your movements, that you're COVID safe. And of course now we've increased uh, mask wearing in certain situations, which is extremely important. Uh, please know that if you're symptomatic and put a mask on, it doesn't mean you're not going to transfer the virus to others. We have had situations where people have symptoms, they're not getting tested and putting a mask on and think they're okay. It's not okay. The mask is simply the fourth line of defence. It is not the only line of defence and it doesn't mean you can't transfer the virus, but it certainly provides that added layer of protection, which is what this is about. When you have a contagious variant, you need to make sure that you have that added layer of protection and that's why that mask wearing is so important. Uh, I will ask Dr Chant to go through all those cases um, and to give detail about where we are at. Uh, and then I'll also ask Deputy Commissioner Warboys to um, focus some comments regarding compliance. Um, we don't like to be heavy handed, but when there's, a, when there's an outbreak during a pandemic, we have to make sure everybody is doing the right thing, whether you're a business, whether you're an individual, whether you're a workplace, we do need everybody to comply and adhere to the rules as strictly as possible. And we need to make sure that that's the case. Um, and I ask everybody to follow the health advice. Uh, health are conducting many, many interviews. So please wait till you get the all clear. Please wait till you get health advice, no matter your circumstances, no matter your situation. Follow the health website. If you need to get tested and isolate, do so. If you need to get tested and talk to somebody, do so. But make sure you follow that health advice. And also we ask for a degree of patience because as you know, our contact tracers are outstanding. 
but in order to make sure that they give the best advice at the best time, they need to go through that process. So we do ask for patience and we do ask for people to isolate until they're given the all clear as I did today for a number of hours. So I do ask for everybody to do that and exercise patience and caution and uh, continue to follow and monitor the health advice. Thank you, Dr Chan. Thank you. So New South Wales recorded those 18 locally acquired cases of COVID in the 24 hours to 8 p.m. last night and 13 were already announced. Um, we, pleasingly, as the Premier said, we had those testing numbers increased at 48,402. And what I'd like to see is that for a week, those testing numbers are sus sustained at those levels or even surpassed. So please, it is incredibly important at this time that we flush out any unrecognised chains of transmission. So of the 18 locally acquired cases, as I said, 13 of those were previously announced yesterday, but I just want to take you through them because they do give a picture. Eight of the cases were linked to the birthday, uh, to the party that was previously reported to, uh, linked to the case linked to the Bondi cluster. Um, all of the cases have been in isolation, but they were for various times in the community whilst infectious. I want to express my appreciation to that, group, that um, party group who um, have supported our investigations. There's a woman in her 20s from the Sutherland Shire who's a close contact of a previously reported case from the Bondi cluster. There's a hairdresser from Western Sydney who works in Double Bay and he's not linked to a known case or cluster. Uh, there's a woman in her 20s from Sydney Eastern Suburbs who's a close contact of the um, hairdresser and also there's a man in his 70s from the Eastern Suburbs who was exposed to the virus at Bondi Junction Westfields but then um, went to the Tropicana Cafe in Darlinghurst and a gentleman in his 50s who is linked to that exposure at the Tropicana Cafe. We've also got um, two women and a man from Sydney South West who are linked to the birthday party and a teenager from the eastern suburbs. Um, she was exposed to the virus at Bondi Junction and a woman in her 20s, um, another case linked to the Double Bay Hair Salon. In terms of the six locally acquired cases, we've got a man in his 30s who attended the Christos um, Peace Terea in Paddington at the same time as a previously reported case linked to the Bondi cluster and three women who are close contacts of a previously reported case who works as a hairdresser at the Double Bay and a gentleman in his 40s who's linked to the birthday party and a man in his 40s and investigations are continuing. So if I summarise yesterday, 18 cases, all bar one of them were linked. Um, the link is we have not established the initial transmission mode for the hairdresser, um, but we have established all links with all of the other cases. And that's particularly what we're looking for. And obviously we will be doing that backward tracing and calling out any people in the upstream, what we call upstream contact tracing to flush out any unrecognised chains of transmission. I want to indicate that at the beginning of the day, we often start off with unlinked cases, but as you can see, um, those linkages have been made and by the time we closed off the numbers, we were able to report that 17 of those 18 cases were all linked and we'll be monitoring that situation closely. Again, the message is um, please continue to not go to work if you have any symptoms at all. Please get tested immediately please monitor the health website. You've probably seen that the exposure venues and the list go up there. And we ask that everyone before they set out checks that website to, to check particularly any new exposure sites that have been linked. It is important that we follow the health um, requirements at this time as we are in a critical phase in the response where we want to see those cases, new cases un and unlinked cases decline. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr Chan. Premier, uh, good afternoon. The Premier made a very important point around compliance where we are in the pandemic. Already, police have issued over 150 uh, cautions to people for not wearing masks on public transport and other places where they should. We've moved to a new setting. Commissioner Fuller has made it very clear to the New South Wales Police Force that we're mo moving much further into a compliance and an enforcement regime around the order 
uh, rather than a simple education response to people and that visibility and seeking people to comply. There are clearly people now that want to be mischievous or simply want to uh, uh, go beyond the order. Um, those people uh, will be spoken to by police and will be issued uh, with a penalty notice rather than given the option of a caution. As we move into the school holidays, people need to understand that if they choose to uh, go outside the order and drive to a location, whether that's um, down the snow, whether that's up the coast, whether that's down the south coast, out west, Traffic and Highway Patrol are well aware of the order and what it says to people and what it commands them to do. And police will be out there enforcing that part of the activity as well as being on our public transport system uh, and in and around cafes, pubs, clubs, making sure that people comply in what is a very fractious time in terms of the pandemic in this particular cluster. I'm sure people would also like to understand where police are up to uh, with the investigation into the transport driver. Uh, that investigation continues as we think more about the offences that may have been committed. Uh, it's not just about a breach of that uh, transport order, but we're thinking now around how, how we look at this uh, uh, these actions of transport drivers and indeed this particular driver around transport offences, work health and safety offences, not just the driver but certainly uh, the organisation uh, that, that employs that driver. Um, it's not as simple as, it's not as simple as issuing a ticket to this gentleman thinking uh, that the whole system is repaired or one person is responsible for where we're at today. Police will continue that investigation, they seek uh, any input that people have in relation to it uh, and, and I hope by, the, by early next week we may have some resolve out of that. But what is important as well is that people need to understand that this operation so far there have been over 360,000 police shifts, there have been over 300,000 security shifts, almost 100,000 ADF shifts and then you put into that cooks, cleaners, the effort that health have put in, over 192,000 people have completed quarantine, it is an extremely complex operation that every single moment, every single time that we get the opportunity to improve it, we will. Thank you. Uh, well, obviously, um, we'll have more to say about that once uh, police have completed their investigations. Uh, but let me make it very, very clear. Uh, everybody in New South Wales who works in our systems know of their obligations. And, uh, and we certainly uh, look forward to providing certainty around uh, what occurred in this situation. I'm as upset as anybody and frustrated as much as anybody. We all work so hard and it's really disappointing when things don't go the way they should. I live and breathe it every day and I feel it intensely every day. We also rely on tens of thousands of outstanding people every day to do jobs that we wouldn't do, to, to be in contact with people with the virus. So I want to continue to thank from the bottom of my heart all those people who put themselves on the line every day. But I also want to say to those people uh, in and around the system who think complacency is okay, it's not okay. It's not okay. And we know it and we feel it and we will get to the bottom of it. And if our government needs to do more to make it even more abundantly clear, or I do note that everybody is well aware of their responsibilities, but when police finish their inquiries, which are broader than just applying the health orders, uh, broader than just uh, applying uh, what's been uh, spoken about, uh, we will certainly do that. Our focus today though, has to be, has to be, on making sure anybody with the mildest of symptoms goes and gets tested. Anybody who is deemed a close contact does not leave their home for 14 days. 14 days, if you're a close contact, you cannot leave your home. And to keep monitoring the health advice. The health advice uh, is updated on a daily basis. Venues, their status may change. People's status may change. Everybody has to be vigilant. And as I said, this is probably, um, if not the most, certainly one of the most concerning times that I've, I've experienced during the pandemic. That's because we're dealing with a virus that's extremely contagious. And we're also dealing with a situation where many people uh, may be forced into isolation in the days ahead. 
and where many people uh, will be asked uh, to follow the health advice in a more vigilant way than they've ever been asked during the course of the pandemic. We have the opportunity to do what New South Wales does best, that's come together and support one another, to take the health advice, but also to be extra cautious. Please think about those members of your family that are vulnerable. Uh, please think about how all of us can limit our activity. I certainly will be. I don't want to put myself in a situation where I could get the virus or unintentionally give the virus to someone. All of us, no matter our circumstances, no matter what we do, have to be careful. And that means not travelling outside of metropolitan Sydney if we've asked you not to do so. We do not want this virus in the regions. We do not want it in areas which currently don't have the virus. That goes without saying. But today is really a day where all of us uh, say to ourselves, this is a serious, serious situation. Our concern level is high and all of us have a role to play in keeping each other safe and, and doing what we do best, coming together. We have the best contact traces, I believe, on the planet. Yes, I'm biased, I'm the Premier. But I know what they've uncovered in the last few days and the, and the rapidity, how quickly they've been able to actually identify cases and get those contacts, um, close contacts and others um, notified, has been just outstanding. And the rest is up to us. We can only ask so much of them. The rest is up to us. It's up to us, all of us doing the right thing, respecting each other and really, really being extra cautious, even going beyond the health advice, if that is our comfort level. And certainly, uh, certainly that's our expectation. <laughs> So three day lockdowns don't work if you've got distributed disease. Three days is not long enough and I think if you look at the reasons for the three days, it's a, basically a pause where you're behind and you can't, where you've, you've got a sudden surge of cases and you want everyone to stay in the same place and that allows you to get any backlog of any contact tracing. It's a really important element and we may well be in that situation. I'm not dismissing any situation, um, but that's the purpose of that strategy. It's to give it to a pause. We're not in that situation where we're not getting to people in terms of the contact tracing. What we're dealing with is the fact that we have got um, any action we need to do is we need to change the trajectory of this infection. So this is infection has got out into the community and there are chains of transmission that we are not aware of. Um, and we know that because we've got some unlinked cases. So there must be some missing links there. And because of that, we don't know the size of the chains that those missing links have established. And therefore, that is the reason for the concern, as well as the fact that we have seen transmission in settings, and I'm not going to overplay this, but in settings, transmissions occurred more frequently than we would have seen before. As I've indicated, we have seen um, very minimal transmission episodes in cases, but this has been more frequent to see those transmissions occurring in retail settings, which is probably, we have seen it to a minor degree, but not the extent that we've seen with this strain. And that proposes more contact tracing because as I indicated yesterday, it means that uh, you know, rather than saying who was in this particular shop, it's who you passed by in the corridors getting to that shop or the elevators. And hence that's why we've taken that very global um, definition of anyone who's been in that Bondi Junction Westfields for that quite substantial period of time to cover that. So let's talk about the general process we do. So what we do is we assess each venue. So not any venue is the same. It's the size of the venue, how you walk into that venue, who do you have to pass, um, what, um, you know, if it's, if it's in a venue the size of a, a massive area, that's very different than a single room for it's the duration you were there. There's multiple factors, as well as the infectivity that's assessed of the individual that is there at the time. Yes, but the room is a large room, and what we're talking. No, I think we need to understand the way the transmission occurs. So the in 
transmission occurs even in the Bondi Junction. I'm not saying that someone down the far end of the hall gets it from the person. What I'm saying is that a person walks along and that there might be someone that comes into contact inadvertently when you cross over. You know yourself when you're crossing over into getting onto escalators, you're often facing the individual, you're not necessarily socially distanced at all times. When you're navigating your way through um, racks of clothes or chests, you sometimes inadvertently come into contact. That's the sort of inadvertent contact I'm talking about. I'm talking about that proximity. In circumstances where we have CCD for footage, where we can actually see the distance people are away from each other, we look at that. We also interview both the case and the other person, the positive case. Um, and can I thank the individual for agreeing, you know, giving us quite comprehensive um, questioning, undergoing that early in the early hours of the morning. Um, it allows us to really understand the movements. Um, we, the routine, I can just absolutely guarantee that um, public health officials have spoken to everyone. We're now working through the complexity of Parliament House. What our focus has been this morning is um, making sure that some critical functions can continue and we've been testing, using rapid testing technology to allow um, the, um, both the lower house and the upper house to pass the um, budget. And we have been progressively working through um, who this gentleman came into contact with and we will progressively work that. Now, um, I have not been advised of that yet. Obviously, cases come in all the time. Um, obviously, if there are additional cases, additional pieces of information, we change our risk assessment. That's what we've done all the time, and we have that standard approach to those investigations. Um, what we have um, determined also, and this is very pleasing, is that um, because the, the um, person at that um, Pizza Parlour got tested very promptly. Um, we were able to use her QR code data. Um, so when she got diagnosed, interviewed, we were able to pull off her QR code, find exactly where she'd been and the time she checked in. And that night, I think the protocol would have gone out at about 11 p.m. Um, on the Monday, on the Monday night. Sorry, the days is blurry. The Monday night, uh, sorry, the Tuesday night, when she was diagnosed to then um, prevent anyone who'd been at that venue because we immediately do the stop and stay orders and get a test. And so there were a group of people impacted at that restaurant. And as you're aware, we did testing on those individuals and those results came back. And in one of them, it came back late into the late into yesterday. This is where ABC TV viewers outside New South Wales leave us. You can continue watching on the ABC News channel or on our YouTube channel. That this gentleman had um, very low infectivity when he presented for testing, um, but obviously for the abundance of caution, we can't preclude that he was infectious the next, the previous day when um, that person was present in Parliament, um, and we are working through that. We convened an expert panel this morning, and those investigations are continuing in terms of the interviews. So it will take us a while, given the complexity of the workplace to work through but our um, contact tracers are conducting those interviews now and there's been extensive testing undertaken. Dr. Jack, can you tell us in that room how many people were there, how many have been declared credible contacts and how many are close contacts and what's the difference between them? For example, why is the premier a credible contact where others in the room are close contacts? What, what so some of, the, some of the elements of the duration whether you actually had any contact with the case. So whilst I'm saying that if you were going into a small room and the case was there, clearly airborne transmission comes into, into play. Um, but, if the, um, but if you haven't, um, so duration of contact, um, the nature of the contact um, and any other details. So we've interviewed the gentleman. Um, we corroborate that with CCD footage. We corroborate that with our um, other um, history from other people that were present at the event and um, we interviewed each of the cases to confirm that. So we will work through that case assessment. It's going to take a while. So at the moment we have advised, um, I think the public health team probably have advised anyone who was eating at that function um, and spending the whole duration of that time and the individual themselves indicated that um, they did move around 
um, the table, they did move around the seated guests because it was a uh, an event, a meet and greet sort of event, um, and they were certainly moving that individual who was infectious was moving around deliberately engaging people in conversation as part of that nature of the event. Whereas some of the other people who were involved in that event had different roles at all and some did have no, have no physical contact or proximity contact to that individual. Now, if we get any additional transmission at that event, we will be the first to um, upgrade any advice and obviously any casual contact has to monitor for symptoms um, but also be prepared that if there's any information that comes to hand that changes that assessment, we will upgrade it. We are not interested in having further transmission of COVID. Um, so we've not, no, the usual process is we are giving the risk um, assessment uh, for the casuals. This is the usual, there is nothing unusual about this. Obviously, the unusual aspect is we have used rapid technology um, and that's not only been for some key individuals, but it's certainly been to enable um, the core functioning of Parliament, where we've used the gene expert technology to allow us to be confident, till we assess the movements of all of the individuals, to allow a, a very small quorum in each of the parliaments. Dr Chair, of the, uh, those linked to the Bondi cluster, how many of them are showing symptoms? And of those that are showing symptoms, how ill are they? Um, we have, um, we'd have to get the information, but I am aware that there are some hospitalised cases. Yesterday, there was no one in ICU, but that changes, so please, um, I haven't had the opportunity today to be updated. Um, but we need to take COVID seriously. For many, it can be a mild illness. Um, for some, you don't have symptoms, and hence our testing recommendation in this context we need. If you're asked to get tested, even if you have no symptoms, please do so. Um, so we can provide that, that information in terms of um, ICU or hospitalisation. I'm happy to speak about my circumstances. Absolutely. I had zero. Uh, he has been interviewed and has confirmed uh, he had zero contact with me and others. Uh, I was also interviewed, had zero contact. In fact, uh, I, I was there for a very short time, uh, addressed the crowd and didn't uh, have any contact with him whatsoever. Uh, but as with all casual contacts, and I'm in the category of thousands of people, as with all casual contacts, it's up to health to reassess at any stage. If they get another case or they deem a casual contact is now a close contact, will I fall into that category? But what I've done this morning is follow the health advice to the letter, in fact, overboard. I got myself tested first thing. I stayed in isolation until I got the negative result. I was interviewed and I've been cleared as a casual contact, as thousands of people have, following the health advice at every stage. And health is at liberty at any stage to change that advice. And if they do, well, then I'm subject to it just like anybody else. But can I make it clear that a number of people are in my situation and, and will be in the coming days? And that's why it's important to continue following the health advice. Uh, it is not in anybody's interests for anybody to not follow the health advice strictly to the letter of the law, but also to go overboard. And that's why this morning, as Dr Chant has said, a number of people uh, will go through the process I have done one by one. They're getting through that list. But people across Sydney will be, will be going through the process I've gone through to determine what status people have. And that health advice has to be adhered to. Premier, why were masks and vaccine guidelines not included in the Public Health Act that led to this limousine driver being able well, clearly, clearly um, every person uh, involved in the system is well aware. In fact, through all the fact sheets and information provided, we're getting to the bottom of that. We're up waiting for police to conduct all of their investigations. And then if we need to do more, we will. But let me make it clear. Uh, it is in black and white what people's responsibilities and obligations are. OK, but, but that's why we'll await, uh, we'll await the police uh, investigation. And as I understand, discussions are already uh, underway with the health minister and, and police and health in, uh, in order to uh, do more if we have to. 
But, uh, but let's not take away from the fact that all of us know what we're told as uh, the advice we need to take. And people need to follow that. It doesn't matter where it's written. Of course, the health orders mean police can fine and, and cause people uh, to have that penalty. But, but all of us know our obligations. And in a pandemic, complacency has no place, has no place. And it's so important to make sure that everybody undertakes their responsibilities at every stage. And that's why I'm appealing to every single citizen. It doesn't matter uh, whether you have a position like I do or you have uh, any, any circumstances, all of us must conform to the health advice to the letter of the law and must continue to watch the health advice in case that advice changes. Can you please not shout? Can you please not shout? quickly ask vaccination? Yeah. Um, at the West Hoxton party, there was a single, four or five people who were vaccinated and they haven't got the virus so far. What does that tell you about a super spreading event if the vaccinated people didn't get the virus? I'd like Dr Chan as a medical expert to answer that one. Okay. A couple of things. It, it, it's pleasing news and we're, and we're actually going to be looking at that quite closely and yes, there were a number of people there that were either aged care workers or healthcare workers who were vaccinated and that is very pleasing to me because obviously um, we need to protect those workers, they are at greatest risk and also are working with the most vulnerable of individuals. Vaccines are not perfect. So I think it's really important that we always look at the hierarchy of controls in our borders. We need to vaccinate them. Um, we need people to adhere to PPE requirements. We need to keep our social distancing and we need to um, do all of those environmental things that reduce the risk of transmission. Vaccines are um, effective in um, preventing serious disease and we know they also have a transmission impact. We know that the Delta strain, although the vaccines have slightly lower performance than against other strains, um, and that's something that we have to be cognizant of. But the key message is, yes, vaccination is fantastic. We need to do it. It protects us against severe disease and hospitalisation, and it also has a transmission reduction, but we will still need to have those other measures. So we, the last thing we want is for people that are vaccinated to think that they don't have to quarantine if they're close contacts, for, that they don't have to wear masks, they are still at risk. We need those multiple layers of controls if we are to keep us safe um, in future incursions. Sorry. Um, we're keeping into regular contact with the public health unit there to assess the risk. As I said, it, um, clearly we're concerned about the fact that the community, this West Hoxton party has um, generated a number of cases. Can I thank those individuals for their cooperation in getting promptly tested and isolating? M the vast majority of them I were isolating, I think it would be from the Monday night. So they were potentially, there were some of them that were in the community for a limited amount of time. I'm particularly wanting to call out that we will be reaching out to a number of people that um, through the, the travel that those individuals took. And so the, some of the transport messages I really would like to be amplified because obviously um, we know that they were infectious on their transport links and we thank New South, Transport for New South Wales helping us get those messages out. So at this stage we're um, very carefully watching the situation and what we're concerned about is if we see transmission cases pop up unrelated to that party, but at the moment all of the cases are there, or some of the other cases have very clear links to western, uh, to eastern suburbs. So oh, they're workers that go in. Yesterday, I think you told us that ten of the thirty or so that were there had tested positive. Yep. And the, since the, the numbers went down yesterday, I, I believe according to the there are four more cases that are linked to that party. How is it then that the number at the party is only in eleven? So there, there were actually about 30 people who attended the party, and as I said, um, how many in the, how many are at the party now? Oh, look, I think it's well over 12, but we'll just have to clarify um, clarify that because we've got the additional gentleman that's come in today. So let's let me get you the numbers. It's a moving feast, and we'll give you the most update. 
but clearly it is positive sign that to date the individuals that were vaccinated have not um, been infected. However, um, those individuals still need to quarantine for the 14 days and we thank and appreciate their assistance in doing so. Sorry? So the two cases that, um, there's three cases where we haven't got a, a clear link. Um, it is the uh, nine-year-old that we haven't got a clear link. The um, hairdresser from Double Bay, we haven't got a clear source there. Um, and there is a person in a, in a, um, a, a health facility that um, we know that there have been a patient there that attended, but we can't find the exact crossover. So there's three cases where we really haven't established the exact mechanism of transmission. Um, the staff are still working on that and will certainly update the community. But certainly widespread testing around the nine-year-old child occurred and has not identified any contact, direct contact of teachers or family members or students at this stage, but testing is continuing. Um, but people of a similar age attended the same GP again while with different wait times. For instance, one person's getting eight weeks, the other two days. Can you explain why there is this variation in that time? Uh, so the Commonwealth Government is responsible for the allocation to general practitioners and as you know at this point uh, general practitioners are getting AstraZeneca vaccine and some doses of Pfizer so your comment it may and clearly the Pfizer is more limited access through general practice so it may be variability in the amount of vaccine that's been, um, that, the, that the GP has ordered or been provided um, so I would ask people to um, work with their local GP, but also their GP may be happy for them to attend another practice if the wait time is less. Um, so I would discuss that with your GP. Thanks, everybody.